Last week we talked about composting and uh, improving your uh, garden soil quality. Um, this week we are excited to have um, our speakers both in Nat Natrona County. Uh, Donna Hoffman is a horticulture educator there and Shannon Tippett is the sensible nutrition educator. Uh, so thank you both for joining us today. Uh, it's always good to see you. Uh, today Donna is going to talk with us about promoting pollinators in the garden. And Shannon is going to talk about what and how and how to donate uh, food safely. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Feel free to type comments in the Q&A or the chat box or raise your hand. Um, we're streaming live on Facebook and we'll watch for your questions there as well. So please don't let us end today's session without answering all of your gardening and food donation questions. Um, and lastly, if you missed last week's class or any, uh, or any of the classes that are upcoming that you're not gonna be able, be able to attend, all of the classes are recorded and available on the website. And with that, I'm gonna say, um, Donna Hoffman, thank you for joining us, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say about promoting pollinators in the garden. Okay, well, um, I am not much of an entomologist, but of course I am an insect a, a fan, especially the butterflies, so I picked slides that had that, my favorite pollinator on them. Um, of course, there are lots of others that we can work with um, and encourage in the garden. <clears throat> um, I'm really happy to be a part of this and glad that we're doing them um, both on Zoom and Facebook Live and that people can access them later on. So if you're joining us um, outside of the uh, live meeting, we're glad to have you um, picking up on some tips through the recordings. Um, so we have quite a few of our vegetable garden plants that actually don't need pollinators to produce food. So if you think about it, pollinators produce fruits. They, they make sure that the plant produces uh, a fruit and makes seeds. So again, those leafy crops that we, we eat, the, the leaves of the plant are ones that we wouldn't need pollinators for but several of them are food for the larva of specifically uh, butterflies and moths. So for instance, last year uh, I had several cabbages that got uh, the, the cabbage caterpillars on them from the, the uh, sulfur butterflies and the white um, cabbage butterfly. And uh, I picked larva off and tossed them into the lawn to feed the, the uh, robins that were pretty prolific in our yard last year but um, this year we're going to try some some netting covers that my mom made for me out of some sheer curtains and we're going to draw string them around individual cabbage plants to keep the butterflies off but i'm planning to um, plant one that i will uh, give off uh, as a an offering to the butterflies and the and the caterpillars so that they will leave the others alone I did notice that the purple cabbage is not nearly as tasty to the to the uh, cabbage caterpillars. So um, I don't know that I'll cover the purple ones, but the green ones. Another one is the parsley and the dill are um, host plants for the larva of a couple of butterflies. So if you are willing to give up some of the ones that uh, you've planted for use in the kitchen, you'll you'll benefit from having the butterflies on those. Um, those that we eat, the edible stems, um, are again plants that don't need pollinators for the portion that we eat. So asparagus, celery, kohlrabi, uh, onions, and leeks are typically plants that don't have pollinators on them. And then plants that we eat the roots won't um, be attracted, attractive to pollinators uh, because we eat the part that is below ground so pollinators wouldn't visit them, for, for instance. <clears throat> and then we have the flowering crops. Um, there are a few that are harvested before the bloom opens. And so broccoli, 
broccolini and cauliflower, we actually eat the flowers, but we eat the buds of the flowers before they open. So unless those are left to bloom and produce seed, we wouldn't see a benefit from pollinators visiting them. So the plants that we are <clears throat> um, intending to use pollinators for are the ones that are insect pollinated. We have quite a few plants in our vegetable gardens that are also wind pollinated and again don't require a pollinator. So most of our grains that include corn um, are ones that are wind pollinated and then tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers are ones that <clears throat> for the most part they are wind pollinated. They will benefit from pollination and um, uh, you can do a little bit to increase the pollination on them. And I think I have that mentioned here again in another slide. Um, <clears throat> so which plants have pollinators that visit in order to produce food? The garden plants that produce fruits need pollination in order for that fruit to be produced or for the seed to grow inside of those fruits. So plants that are left for seed collection definitely need pollination to occur. And those that are wind pollinated can be enhanced by hand pollination. So again, uh, the plants that are wind pollinated but they can benefit from hand pollination are the tomatoes. And one of the ways that people that grow tomatoes in greenhouses, many of the, the tomatoes we buy in the store um, are greenhouse grown and they are grown in a greenhouse specifically to keep pollinators out, but the air current moving through the greenhouse to keep the greenhouse cool will help with pollination, but they oftentimes will actually um, install something on the supports for the tomatoes that will shake those plants in order to help with the, the uh, wind pollination. So if they do have insects visiting them outdoors, the insect wings will actually move some of the pollen around and help with pollination. And then if you are out in the garden, it doesn't hurt to grab a hold of the, the stems of those plants and give them a little shake so that the pollen is moved inside of the individual flowers and goes from the, uh, the stamens to the style where it is sticky and receptive to the pollen in order to make more seeds in each of the flowers. <clears throat> so eggplants and peppers are in the same family as tomatoes and they have a very similar flower. So again, that shake, shake, shake um, can help with pollination on those hand pollinated flowers. And then squash, both the winter and the summer squash as well as gourds, um, are benefited from hand pollination. Uh, periodically through the gardening season, we'll um, have questions about squash in particular not setting fruit. And so we do recommend periodically that people invest in some inexpensive paint brushes, often the ones that comes in a kid's watercolor kit or the additional paint brushes you can purchase for 50 cents sometimes even less for um, kids watercoloring projects are, are quite suitable for pollinating summer squash, winter squash, as well as the gourds. And again, those are in the same family. So um, very similar process that you'd put the paintbrush on the male flowers. So this family has specific male flowers. The male flowers will come out first and then the female flowers will come on. And um, so you take the paintbrush and, and put it in the male flower, collect pollen, and then move that pollen to the style on the female flowers. The other thing you can do is actually remove the male flower from the plant and actually touch the male flower into the female flower to get the pollen transferred from flower to flower. <clears throat> so the plants that definitely benefit from pollination include cucumbers, Melons and watermelons, berries, our fruit trees, and the peas and the beans. Um, they can self-pollinate, but if they are visited by our bees, those will definitely benefit from pollination. So we have a variety of insects that um, visit our gardens and um, do a majority of the pollination. 
So bees are probably the biggest pollinator we have in our flower and vegetable gardens. And we have the honeybees that we all think of um, when bees come to mind. And those are the social bees that live in colonies together. Most of our native bees are solitary bees and they live um, oftentimes underground, sometimes in little tunnels that they create. So we have mason bees that create their own little nests um, and, and uh, egg laying tubes with mud that they collect. Um, there are several other uh, bees, the, the leaf cutter bees will actually collect little circles of leaf tissue and build their, their colony where they're laying eggs. Um, they'll put a little pollen ball from some flower or, or plant that they have visited and put that pollen ball in the egg laying chamber, then they'll lay an egg, then they'll put another layer of leaf tissue and then another pollen ball. And so you can see that they will visit several flowers as they're collecting the little um, circles of leaf tissue that they're laying down and building the tube, and then also visiting the flowers to collect pollen that they're leaving that food source for each of the individual bee larvae in their nest. So they visit quite a few plants in order to just get their eggs laid. Um, and then they also do visit the, the flowers to collect um, nectar because adult insects usually are feeding on the nectar source. So we wanna think about um, maybe planting flowers in the garden that are a nectar source as well as pollen source for the insects that visit the, uh, the flowers to benefit their larva. And after the bees, flies, uh, you wouldn't really think of flies as pollinators, but many, many, many of our flowers um, are attractive to flies. In particular in Wyoming, one that comes to mind is the sweat bee. And oftentimes this iridescent green bee will fly and, and hover around us. I see them a lot during different fairs. Um, kids are out in the heat and uh, they will actually um, be attracted to and, and lap up the sweat from off of our bodies because they are looking for the salt source. Anyway, a variety of different flies will also visit quite a few of our flowers. And as they are visiting the flowers, the hairs on their body will collect pollen and pick them up just like the bees do. Flies don't have quite as much hair on their bodies, but they do collect quite a bit of pollen and transfer it from flower to flower. One of the reasons that pollination works so well is that flowers are open during a particular season. And so if one species of flower is all that's open at a particular time, then that's where the, the critters are gonna collect the pollen and they will take it from flower to flower to flower in a particular species because it wouldn't benefit um, a tomato plant to have melon pollen transferred into that flower, but they wanna visit flowers of the same species in order to get pollination to happen. And then butterflies and moths, are probably our next biggest pollinators. And they have some hairs on their body as well, but most of, of their body is covered with scales. And the scales will also pick up pollen as they are transferring from, from uh, flower to flower. So we've probably um, all been beneficial of watching like the hummingbird moths during the day, or if we've sat real quietly long enough that the butterflies get comfortable with us, we can see them uncurl their proboscis and stick it into the flower and sip up nectar. And as they are sipping up nectar with that proboscis, uh, they're picking up pollen, not only on their proboscis, but also on their feet and they will transfer it um, from flower to flower. Uh, then we have wasps and wasps oftentimes have a real slick, hard body. Their exoskeleton doesn't have much in the way of hair on it but they do have some hair and uh, oftentimes will have barbs on their legs that will help to pick up pollen. And they will again, move it from flower to flower. Sometimes ants are pollinators and they do again, have a few hairs or barbs on their exoskeleton and they will pick some up. And then another 
insect that is sometimes um, not really seen as a pollinator, oftentimes seen as a pest, are the beetles. Um, and they're recognized by that split down the middle of their back uh, wings. And then they have the elytra, the wings that actually help them in flight underneath their, their elytra or their uh, outside wings. And so their body is kind of split in half over their abdomen. They're um, oftentimes pretty shiny, um, sometimes ridged and even sometimes iridescent. So quite a few colors of the beetles, but they visit a variety of different flowers and will pick up pollen and, and transfer it. And then many of us are aware that uh, we have hummingbirds that serve as pollinators. And not so much in Wyoming, but in other regions of the world, mammals, specifically bats, are the uh, major pollinators for specific fruits. The one that I know of uh, specific is uh, figs are oftentimes pollinated by bats. So the flower shape is what attracts pollinators. And so I've used the symbols from the previous page to indicate which individual insects will visit different shaped flowers. So we have the bowl shaped flowers and those include things like the bell flower and the rose. I would pretty much consider the squash flowers to fit in that bowl shaped flower. And so most of those are gonna be visited by uh, bees. They can potentially be visited by uh, the beetles and as, as well by bats. Now, as far as I know, the bats that we have in Wyoming are not necessarily um, great pollinators, but they may visit periodically in a garden that has lots of flowers that are open at nighttime. Then we have the flat flowers. Uh, so compound flowers like sunflower or echinacea, as well as those that are clusters of real small flowers like yarrow and verbena. Um, so, um, our vegetable flowers, the ones that I can think of that, that uh, fit that category, like the yarrow and the verbena, are things like parsley and um, even carrot. If it's left to the second year because it's a biennial, it would have a, a umbel shaped or a very flat compound flower uh, when it's going to pollination. And the critters that will visit those flat flowers are the bees, flies, the butterflies and the moths, wasps, and again, the ants. And then bell-shaped flowers like the foxglove. Um, and I suppose some of the squash that may have a, a tight flower might fit in that bell-shaped category where the bees visit most often. And then penstemons, um, even the peas and the beans and pansies will have um, the pollinators visit them. The bees, the wasps, and ants are the most prevalent to visit those. And then the tube-shaped flowers uh, are most often visited by ants and the hummingbirds. So things like honeysuckle and hyssop in our gardens would attract those. Uh, and they may bring in flower, or the pollinators to the garden that might visit some of the other vegetable uh, fruit producing plants in our gardens as well. And then there are some other beneficial insects such as, as lacewings. They are reputed to potentially pollinate as the adults move from flower to flower collecting nectar for their food source. Um, but we do need to keep in mind that their larvae are very beneficial because they will feed on some of our pest pollinate or our pest insects that are on the uh, plants in the garden. So we wanna make sure that we, we are open-minded to having those beneficial insects visiting the garden and minimizing pesticides so that those beneficial insects are there to, to not only pollinate, but um, also consume some of the insects we don't want in the, the gardens. And then, as I mentioned with my cabbage at home, the butterflies and the moths lay caterpillars, the, the eggs that become caterpillars, and those um, we need to keep in mind that they are there, um, the, the larvae are there consuming some of our product in the garden, and so we may have to be willing to um, offer up uh, one or two of our 
cabbages or other plants in the garden so that the, the uh, butterfly and moth larva have a food source during the growing season. And then again, those, those caterpillars are voracious eaters, um, but in order to have the beautiful adults that are pollinators, we need to, to uh, provide a food source in the garden for those caterpillars. So I'm open to questions, or if we want to, we can have Shannon go ahead and do her presentation, and then we can do questions for both of us at the end. Thank you, Donna. And we, as we know, I mean, as gardeners, at least, I think all of us appreciate all of those you know, beneficial insects visiting our garden, the butterflies especially, or, you know, fun to watch. And I know um, my daughter gets excited about going out to see that. And so that's something also that, you know, it just piques that interest. So last week we talked about engaging youth in gardens. So this is one of those things that I think sort of ties into, into that as well. Um, so awesome. Well, thank you, Donna. I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, um, but we'll give people the time to time to type. And and um, while they're doing that, Shannon, why don't we why don't we just jump on over to you? All right. Sounds good. Um, hang on. No problem. So while, while we're getting set up, Donna, I'm curious, do you plant uh, flowers around and in throughout your gardens too? We do actually. Um, I've uh, started doing more of that. My husband is, is definitely a marigold fan. And so we've got marigolds in each of our raised beds. I've been planting uh, morning glory specifically to bring in the pollen, the uh, hummingbirds in the garden, as well as adding wonderful color in with uh, our flowering plants. And then um, plants like Cosmos and Xenia will definitely bring in the pollinators um, to bring them to those particular flowers. Um, what, one of the other plants that um, we grow a lot of is potatoes. And that's another one that we don't necessarily need the pollinators for, but we sure enjoy having them in the yard. Sure. So we've had um, luck. We, I don't know if I had my raised beds in the ground the last time you were at the house. We put we put a couple of raised beds in last spring, and um, we put in uh, some perennials that we planted around too. And um, and the Veronica especially was the one that's last year really stood out as just being covered with bees. Um, like you you could go out and just brush the bees off of the, the plant that was just humming with them. The delphinium also seemed to attract bees and hummingbirds. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about flowers that might um, be attracting them as, into the garden yeah. too. Yeah, so the idea of just bringing pollinators into the garden makes it very, very much interesting for um, kids to enjoy, um, as well as definitely benefiting all of the flowers in the garden. And the more pollinators we bring into the garden, the better it is for pollination to occur with the plants that we do want pollination to happen on. Sure, sure. Well, that's great. So well, now that we're going to have all of these pollinators visiting our garden, we're going to have bumper crops this year. So, um, so Shannon's going to talk to us about how we can donate uh, that extra produce safely. Yes. Yes. Um, can everybody see my slideshow? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So first. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about if you don't have an idea of what to grow, here are some ideas for you, uh, especially if you're planning on donating them to um, anti-hunger organizations in your community, which is what we're here for, right? Um, so, the, and this varies from community to community. Um, so what is good here in Casper might not necessarily be good 
you know, in Lusk or Cody or Cheyenne or Laramie. Um, so this is just very general. Um, so some good things that uh, food pantries really have an easy time getting rid of are broccoli, carrots, cucumbers, eggplant, uh, green beans, um, peppers, potatoes, spinach, uh, summer squash, um, whether it's zucchini or yellow crookneck, um, tomatoes, and like I said, zucchini. Um, so some things that are kind of a little bit harder are kale, um, some other leafy greens. Uh, for example, spinach goes really well here in Casper from our food pantries, um, but there's a couple of pantries in Cheyenne that can't really get rid of it. Um, parsnips, winter squash like spaghetti and butternut squash, specialty squash like the patty pan, which is fun to grow and look at because it's, like, it's got a weird shape, um, and that the kabucha squash, which is part of the seeds for the grow a little extra. Um, so that, that's not to say that you can't grow and um, donate your excess, because um, this leads into our next slide, the, the benefits of, um, oh, oops, it doesn't go into the next slide. I know, my, I know the order of the slides, really I do. Um, <laughs> but if you grow the, the patty pan squash, the spaghetti squash, uh, parsnips, um, even some cases beets don't go very well. Um, you can still donate those and the sensible nutrition educator in your area will give educational pieces of information about that vegetable or, or fruit um, and, and also uh, recipes to go with that. So if you, if I have a bunch of patty pan squash, I'm going to give them a recipe for um, a, a stuffed zucchini, which a, a patty pan is very much like a zucchini taste wise. So that really works. And you have a little bowl as opposed to a little boat. Um, so we do, if you have already planted those things and want to donate them, please, by all means, please donate them. Um, and we will get out the educational piece and the recipes for those people to use those those uh, types of produce. So Shannon, um, I'm sorry. can I just ask a quick question? So yeah. when, when you say harder to donate or difficult to donate, is that mainly because people just don't know how to use that produce or isn't something that people are seeking out? Beets right. Or, or whatever. Um, it, for whatever reason, it's just not going, it go, moving out of the pantry, um, which is what the the um, this next slide is about. Um, the pantries need, want, love local produce. Um, they don't get a lot of fresh produce, um, the, and a lot of the times the stuff they do get is like potatoes and onions because it lasts long, so long. Um, or canned vegetables. So there are a lot of pantries that I've worked with that are like, just give us whatever produce that you have, we will take it and we will make sure people get it. So please donate whatever produce that, that you have. Um, but a lot of the uh, reason that some of that stuff doesn't go is because some of the patrons, for whatever reason, don't have access to the kitchen equipment, whether they live in a place where they don't have a kitchen or their oven broke and they can't pay to fix it quite yet, or a combination of the two, or it, just for whatever reason, they don't have the kitchen equipment to cook the produce. I'll just interject a little bit. I think, I think culturally, um, we're becoming more and more diverse in Wyoming on the things that people grow. Um, I've I've been doing this for almost 20 years and rarely have I gotten questions about okra growing okra, but this year already I've gotten two questions about okra. So I think there are produce items that um, people grow and eat in other parts of the world that maybe are not as prevalently used in Wyoming. And so people don't know how to prepare it. And, and once they learn how to use it, they'll be interested in getting it. So I really like the idea that our educators in the CNP program get recipes out there for those 
produce items that are donated that might be a little bit unusual for a majority of the pallets in Wyoming. Yes, yes. Um, while we're, on it, we're just going to skip down to the, the um, exposure and knowledge. Some people don't have exposure to stuff like okra. Um, or uh, Donna uh, mentioned a lot of uh, other things that might not be as common, like kohlrabi, leeks, broccolini, parsnips, uh, even stuff like bok choy, rutabagas. Um, they might not necessarily know what those are or how to cook them. Um, so then, um, the, so they have a harder time, like, oh yeah, I will make something with leeks in it because they, they may or may not know. Um, but like I, like I said, we as sensible nutrition educators will get that education piece and a recipe to go with it. Um, and then, uh, cooking time, uh, it might be another reason why some of that stuff does not go as quickly as other things like a spaghetti squash. A spaghetti squash is people pretty much know what they are, but it takes a lot of time to prepare a spaghetti squash. You have to try and heat it up to cut it open. You have to <laughs> bake it and then mix whatever you want it and bake it again. And um, so the the winter squashes that I, that I mentioned, spaghetti squash, butternut, uh, acorn, um, they, they may just take too long to cook um, because some of the patrons that go to those anti-hunger organizations just don't have time, whether they're working multiple jobs or their kids have uh, a bunch of after, after school activities or um, a combination of the two, <laughs> or they're taking classes or, you know, just for whatever reason, they don't have a lot of time to cook. Um, so, uh, produce donations um, that are great to have uh, raw and cooked, like broccoli, carrots, celery, um, the the leafy greens. So you know um, you can have the leafy greens raw in a salad, but some of those don't fit. You know the exposure and the knowledge aspect of it. Um, so that, those are some considerations when you're trying to think, what can I do to get the best um, amount of produce out to the people that need it? Um, okay, so this takes us to the, the next portion is the benefits of donating through Sensible Nutrition and taking, bringing your produce to the extension offices in your county. Um, the Sensible Nutrition Educators have established partnerships with the anti-hunger organizations in your community, are familiar with the, their needs, their schedules, uh, their clientele. Um, so the dropping the produce off at your extension office with your Sensible Nutrition Educator is just an easy one-stop. Um, and then your Sensible Nutrition Educator can get it out to who needs it because um, there are some pantries that are only open two days a week or only open one day a week. Um, so, and we should know those, those schedules for those food pantries. Um, that way you don't have to try and guess and take it in on a Friday and they're only open on Wednesdays. Um, also, we have the food safety measures in place for donations. Uh, we will have coolers out that you can just drop the produce in uh, and shut the shut the lid. Um, in the case of our office, we have two coolers that we can use. Um, I usually put one out in our community garden space uh, and have one in the building. So you can go either way. And I check those multiple times a day. Um, and then we also have other food safety measures in place like a refrigerator. Like I said, I check them multiple times a day. They go right to the fridge when I, when I do pick them up. Um, we weigh the donations as well. So for those that are master gardeners looking for volunteer time, we can give you the weight of your donation. So you can put that for your volunteer time. Um, like I brought up before, we do the educational materials and the recipes with the produce. So please bring us whatever, we will take whatever. Um, and then we can spread the donations across the community. 
Um, there are some communities that are smaller and only have one food pantry, but then there are others that are larger and have multiple food pantries uh, like Casper and Cheyenne. Um, and also we have here in Casper, we have Meals on Wheels. Um, and then there are senior centers and boys and girls clubs that are all uh, anti-hunger organizations that we can spread that donation out. Um, and I always like, oh, I donated to this food pantry last time. So this is going to another food pantry or this is a smaller uh, donation so it can go to one of the smaller pantries. Um, so the, that's a, a really great way of, so you don't have to figure it out yourself. You can just bring it to your sensible nutrition educator and we can figure it out. Um, and then this takes us to the last slide I'm gonna talk about. Um, when you bring us your produce, uh, don't wash any of the produce. Um, if it has dirt on it, like carrots, potatoes, brush it off. Um, don't bring us anything that's covered in mud. Um, but just brush it off and don't wash it because in that actually starts the process of food processing, which goes into food processing laws that we don't want to deal with. <laughs> um, so um, we as CMP educators will let the organizations know that we take the vegetables and the fruits to, to wash it before they use it. Um, which takes me to the next point, don't process it, don't put stickers on it. A lot of glues on stickers may not be food safe. Um, at Sensible Nutrition, we have special stickers that we put on the bags that tell what that piece of produce is and also say, please wash before preparing. Um, we will do that for you, you don't have to do that. Um, and that way it just stays safe. Um, and then keep it cool. You, let's say you can't get to uh, get to us right away after you've harvested. Just keep it in a refrigerator or a cooler. Or if you have a root cellar, I don't know a lot of people in Wyoming that do, but if you do, <laughs> uh, you can keep it in your root cellar and then bring it to us and put it in the cooler. Um, and then we'll put it in the refrigerator. Um, and then also, you should probably uh, harvest it in the morning when it's cool, before it gets too hot. Um, that uh, keeps the produce from wilting, especially the, the leafy green ones. Um, does that cover it all, Kaylee? Okay. <laughs> all right. I will also take questions now. Awesome. Well, thank you, Shannon and uh, Donna. Well, both of you appreciate the information. So, you know, donating produce is one of those things. I guess I hadn't really thought about all of those things, Shannon. Um, you, uh, you think, oh, well, it's easy to donate it and it's going to go to a family in need and somebody who's, who's going to be able to use that. Um, but it's not always that simple, right? So are there any other... Um, issues that you might run into or things people should avoid um, or any other tips you got for us? I'll just mention that um, things like the carrots and the potatoes, they actually say that they, they stay fresher longer if you don't wash the dirt off of them. So um, as, long as, as long as you get most of it off and it's, it stays in your garden, you're gonna benefit from leaving it, majority of it in your garden, but don't, don't scrub them because you're taking off that protective layer on the, the produce and then they won't last as long. Um, so people can wash them when they get them to their home where they're gonna actually use them. Great. That's actually on the slide, I just yeah, didn't say it. <laughs> Um, I would also say don't worry about like packaging up things up into smaller packages if you're donating through CMP or through extension when we get all the produce in for the day, we can take all the tomatoes and put them into bags and do all of that for you based off of all the donations that come in. Um, so we, we try to be as helpful as we can for you who are donating and then also knowing what our partners need in the community in terms of how much they can accept and how it needs to be packaged for their clients. So we, we're kind of that go-between and we're always there to answer questions. If you'd rather donate directly, that's totally fine. Um, but if you're wondering about any of that, you can always call your educator and they're happy to share 
information with you. We're super excited about all the donations that come in. So awesome. Um, it's, I was also wondering if there is a list of food pantries across the state. Um, if people aren't sure where to donate, um, if they wanted to donate directly, um, if there was a resource available to direct people. Yes, I'll get you the link for that. Um, CMP kind of manages a master list of all the pantries we're aware of in this state. Um, and Food Bank of Wyoming also has lists of food um, anti-hunger organizations, food sites in the state as well. I think there's a lot of crossover between the two lists, but I think the Food Pantry or Food Bank of Wyoming, their list is all their partner organizations. And while we work with those, we may also work with organizations who aren't a, pantry, a partner of Food Bank of Wyoming. Gotcha, okay. So one of the things I was going to mention is that there is a publication out um, promoting pollinators on your, your place. Um, it's a publication put out by the University of Wyoming Extension through our small acreage group. And it has a lot of information in it about flowers that are um, not necessarily vegetable garden plants that, that bring in pollinators to your property. And it's a good, great way to promote pollinators just as a healthy habitat on your, your home property. Um, and then I'm sure Chris is promoting this on all of the, the uh, segments, but each of the extension offices across the state can access this and print copies for you. Um, you can also reach many of these publications from the University of Wyoming website um, through the extension page and then go to our publications to reach it. And there's information out there about growing vegetables that you may be interested in trying in your garden that you may not have ever grown before. And so it's a great way to become familiar with um, a, a larger palette of produce that you might even try in your garden so that you are enjoying um, new produce through the things that you grow in your garden and, and educating the kids in your circle of influence on trying vegetables that, that they might not have tried and then sharing extra that can go to the food pantries um, to help uh, diversify produce that uh, those who visit the, the anti-hunger organizations uh, will benefit from as well. Thank you for pointing those publications out. Excellent resources, both of those. Um, and we'll try to make all of these publications available under the resources on our website. There's so many, I'm, I probably missed one or two, but I'll make sure I add those uh, under today's recording as well. Um, because that vegetable growing um, publication really does kind of cover the broad spectrum of the things that we can grow here in Wyoming, including planting tips, general care, harvesting, and, and all of that information to help you successfully grow those things uh, in Wyoming. So excellent information. Thank you very much. Well, this has been a great session. I appreciate all of the information. Um, I want to also just say next week's class will be uh, raised bed gardening. And we'll also talk uh, about partnering with Master Gardeners and Sensible Nutrition Program. But we're going with um, two of our educators from the Campbell County office, uh, Mandy Reynolds and Taylor Morris up there in Gillette. And then on May 16th, um, we'd love to invite all of our uh, Master Gardener coordinators, all of our sensible nutrition educators, and all of our Master Gardener volunteers to join us in a conversation about uh, potential volunteer opportunities. As you've probably picked up, uh, Sensible Nutrition is doing a, a lot of gardening work um, in their extension, in extension programming, uh, not just nutrition work. And so um, there's quite a bit of overlap in some of the work and um, efforts that we're taking on. And so we're excited to grow this partnership with the Sensible Nutrition Program and um, love the opportunity to talk about what volunteer opportunities there are um, out there across the state that Master Gardeners uh, volunteers could get involved with. Um, so we'll look forward to those conversations and hope that you can join us uh, then as well. Again, today's re uh, class is recorded, so um, you can always view it later, or if you have a 
mention it to a friend who said, oh, I wish I could have been there. Um, you can always point them to the recording as well so that they can um, gain the information that was shared with us today. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, wish everyone a great afternoon, have a great week, and we hope to see you next Monday. Um, and thanks again, Shannon and Donna, for uh, sharing with us today. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to be here and share that information with us. We're happy to be here. So thanks for including us. Great. Well, have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next time.